one. Has joined I'm, the conference. I'm the uh, Mojave County uh, Communications Director, Roger Galloway. We have with us today our County Health Director, Denise Burley. Our Chairman of the Board of Supervisors, Gene Bishop, is with us as well. And we have several of the CEOs from our local hospitals. They include Michael Stinger from the Western Arizona Medical Center. We have Brian Turney here from the Kingman Regional Medical Center. And Heliciano Huron, who is All from the Valley View Radio Medical Central Center. Radio. So Enjoy they're joining the us uh, back here again for the third time, uh, the third press conference in which they've been involved as well. Uh, we're going to start off with statements from each of our participants before turning to the press for questions I uh, will first call on the press when we turn to them by individual outlet so please identify yourself by name and your outlet uh, we may you may then ask a question and have a follow-up as well after I've called on some individual outlets and re reporters can then simply pipe in and say a question, and I'll call on you, and you can go ahead, so you can continue uh, along that line. Uh, by the way, uh, we're, we're, of course, going through some very difficult times right now throughout the world, through our, our county as well. Uh, we have 116 cases as of now, with seven, uh, 76 in Kingman, 30 in Lake Havasu, 11 in Bullhead City, and there are 10 deaths. Uh, I'd like to start off first with each of our uh, CEOs, if any of you would like, to, or each of you would like to make a statement, Michael Stanger. So first of all, I'd like to state that I'm not Hildy Angus, and I have no desire to fill this chair on any long-term basis. I'm only here as an interloper, just to clarify. Also, I'd like to clarify um, a media report earlier this week about bed capacity at Wormsey. There was either a misunderstanding or a misinterpretation of what our status was, so I'm going to give an update right now. We have a 20-bed ICU that's open all year round, and as of today at 10 o'clock in the morning, our census was 13, and we had a 14th patient in the ED that was ready to be um, transferred upstairs for intensive care there. <clears throat> we also have a 12-bed ICU called ICU West. That was the former ICU before we built the new one, the 20 better. That 12 bed unit, just like the 20 bed unit, have all private rooms, medical gases, cardiac monitoring, and all the things that an ICU would have. That's the unit that we've identified is a unit that's gonna be segregated for patients that have been tested for COVID, whose results are still pending, so they're suspected of having COVID, or those that have been tested and have been confirmed that they do have the COVID virus. So that's a 12 bed unit. Today at 10 o'clock in the morning, we had three patients in that unit and only one of the patients was tested positive and was on a ventilator. So we've got plenty of capacity in that ICU, which is reserved for people that are suspected or um, confirmed. Thirdly, we have another, um, eight bed ICU, which actually was opened when the hospital was first founded back in 1984. It has not been used as an ICU or any kind of an inpatient care facility for some time. It's been used for other purposes, but it still is equipped and now it's furnished and supplied with um, uh, things that we use in an ICU. So we've got that unit that's ready. We've not deployed anybody to, we've not deployed patients or staff to it because we don't need it yet, but it's ready to go. So we've got plenty of capacity. We've got 40 beds, critical care beds that we could potentially ramp up to, assuming of course that we had um, patients to fill those beds and staff to uh, take care of the patients uh, that would be there. If worse came to worse, and I know most hospitals have this capability or should, if we had to and we got overrun with critical care patients, we theoretically could use nine of our PACU bays which is our recovery room. And we have another 13 monitored beds in our pre-op prep and hold area that's associated with the, uh, the operating room. So we could potentially add 22 more critical care beds. And they wouldn't be in private, um, private rooms for isolation. Those would be reserved for patients that are um, critically ill, but not suspected or confirmed with COVID. So we have potentially um, up to 62 critical care beds at Wormsey uh, if the need arises. Thank you. Kingman Regional Medical Center, Brian Turney. Yes, thank you. Um, 
I've had some questions about uh, things heating up in Kingman, and I think the best way that I can uh, share information on that, that is to share some data uh, that what we're seeing at our hospital. Uh, from a testing standpoint, uh, we've done 647 tests at our, our facility. Uh, we've had results on 591. Uh, there's 56 pending, but we've had 59 positives, which is uh, much higher than it was before. I will share with you, over the past week, week and a half, probably three quarters of those have come from a local nursing home. So a lot of the acceleration that we're seeing in the positives really aren't out in the community, uh, but at, at, a, at a local nursing home, and, and they're facing some challenges with that. Um, on an inpatient basis, we have 12 patients in our hospital right now that have tested positive for COVID. Um, nine of those came from the nursing home. Overall, our total number of patients we've treated uh, over this whole pandemic period is 24 COVID patients. And again, uh, about three quarters of those came from a local nursing home. Um, vents, we have four people on vents. Uh, two of those are COVID related. So um, we have seen some increases um, from our standpoint in treating patients, but we're not seeing it from a community spread, so to speak. In fact, if you take the, the patients from, from the nursing home uh, setting, if you take that out, it's pretty flat, quite frankly, as far as what's going on in Kingman, as far as the number of positives. So I think when you put those numbers in context, I think uh, especially when you have community leaders and others having to make decisions about whether to reopen or not, I think you have to look at the numbers, where they're coming from, et cetera. So I just think it's important for people to be aware of that. All right, uh, Feliciano uh, Huron from the Valley View Medical Center. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for uh, having us here today. A uh, couple of uh, items that we wanted to bring up. Um, again, uh, with so much happening in the communities and so much that's happening um, around the world, uh, one of the things that does pop up uh, quite extensively is a lot of misinformation um, that is circulating um, in regard to um, specifics around COVID, um, the, the process of how you would get COVID and so forth, and as well as um, local um, things that seem to pop up. Um, one of the things that I would like to speak to directly is the, um, the question in regard to PPE in our community and in our facilities. Um, we as a hospital are currently holding over 40 days of PPE, protective equipment um, for our facility. Um, we also know that the other facilities in the community as well um, are working diligently to have PPE for our staff and others. Um, so again, wanted to address that directly with the public so that everyone's aware that, um, that PPE is out there and our staff has access to that PPE. Um, the other piece we want to talk about is that there are partnerships that are being created. Um, I think that uh, through this pandemic, we're finding out that um, many of us have to come together to bring some other resources um, with outside agencies. And we've been working directly with uh, Indian Health Services and supporting of the populations um, that they also support. And we have been able to get uh, four portable ventilators that they have brought into our facility um, to support any of the population that would be coming through the Indian Health Services um, arena as well. So a lot of activity going on, a lot of things that are going on. And then the partnerships with our local hospitals in our county are critical. Our sister facility in Havasu as well, um, we are from the same company. So we share a lot of those resources and are able to support each other in regard to the things that we're doing. So again, as we reach out to the public, uh, we implore that people um, please go out to the websites, educate yourself through CDC, through the Department of Health. Um, also ask questions in regard to the things that you may hear. Um, there is PPE out there for our staff. There's plenty of, um, of support um, as we gear up um, to take care of patients in the community throughout Mojave County. And again, uh, we're very thankful for all the hospitals and <clears throat> for everyone that's pulling together to get us through this pandemic time. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, there was a special board meeting earlier today <coughs> at noon. Board of Supervisors met, and among other things, uh, a discussion in, ensued uh, dealing with the governor's order from his press conference yesterday, and some action was taken, and we have the chairman of the board here with us as well uh, to discuss that and other, uh, other items as well. Jean Bishop. Jean. Thank you, Roger. I'm sure a lot of our residents uh, 
tuned in and watched the governor yesterday as he gave his, uh, his talk about the extension of the executive order. Uh, the governor's theme was stay home, stay healthy, stay connected, and return stronger. So as of today, 320 Arizona residents have died from COVID-19 with more than 7,648 confirmed cases in the state of Arizona. Comparatively, Mojave County has 117 confirmed cases and uh, has seen 10 deaths. And uh, my condolences go out to the families and friends of, of those that have passed. So in addition to allowing elective surgeries to resume on May 1st, the, the governor's announcement uh, included several, several uh, modifications. Um, a focus on increased testing starting May the 2nd for anyone who thinks they're infected or have recently been exposed to this virus and could be infected with COVID-19 is gonna be made available. And uh, we just learned today that that availability is gonna be in at least the Kingman area. And I encourage everyone that would like to participate in this testing to visit um, the website of the Arizona Health Department at www.azhealth.gov slash testing blitz. And you can get your, your testing locations and get more information about that. So he also said that this coming Monday, May the 4th, non-essential retail stores can begin voluntarily partial reopening with curbside pickup and delivery services as long as they implement the sanitation and physical distancing measures. He also said that starting May 8th, <clears throat> non-essential retail stores may expand their voluntary partial reopening by in-person operations where they must operate under strict physical distancing. They need to have limited occupancy and sanitation protocols with fitting rooms to remain closed at the clothing stores. He further uh, reinforced that travel restrictions will remain in place through May the 15th, and, um, and that's from areas that have a substantial community spread of this virus. And then uh, vulnerable adults are, uh, are uh, suggested that they stay home and refrain from participating in any of these new openings. So uh, the justification that our governor gave was that the state has not yet seen enough of a trend and reduction of the positive reported cases and COVID-19 deaths to lift these restrictions. The virus is not going away, the governor said, and he's trying to mitigate the illnesses and reduce the deaths. The governor further emphasized that bars are not under consideration for reopening, but that a plan to lift some restrictions on dine-in restaurants will be forthcoming and released next week, uh, with the best case scenario being that of May the 12th. So we can expect to uh, be able to go out to dinner once again with limitations. And, uh, and lastly, um, something that everybody needs to keep in mind, when the governor was pressed, he made it very clear this is a statewide order, enforceable by law, subject to penalties. So in the meeting that the Board of Supervisors had this morning, after much discussion and debate, we decided that we wanted to voice our disappointment with this extension and modifications with the letter that'll be forthcoming from the Board of Supervisors. And uh, that letter will, will uh, outline our concern and our frustrations here in Mojave County, uh, mostly um, because of our proximity to California and Nevada and the influx of, of our um, recreators that are using our facilities. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Chairman Bishop. And um, the, the kind of the woman of the hour <laughs> at the center of much attention in uh, recent weeks, uh, let's turn to our Mojave County Health Director, Denise Burley, uh, for her opening statement. Great, thank you, Roger. Thanks everyone for participating in this today. I wanted to elaborate a little bit on the testing event and some details that are uh, for this coming Saturday because uh, it, time is quick, it's gonna go, um, you know, it's, we're that, wow. I've been talking a lot today, so sorry. <laughs> yes, you have. Is your, mic yeah. up, is your mic up sufficiently? I wanna make sure. Okay. Okay. I, I think we're good, but okay. um, the testing event this Saturday is sponsored by Sonora Quest. They have 500 test kits available. This will be a mobile site, so it means it'll be drive-through. People will re be swabbed, those, and those test results will be returned within about two to three days to those individuals. Um, 
as I understand it, this, this is also a free event. And so um, it will run from 7 a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. that day. There may be additional events scheduled in the county, and so I encourage you to use the website that Supervisor Bishop has mentioned to, uh, to check because those will be updated daily and we will know more information as we go along. Those, those particular agencies register through ADHS and so therefore we're not aware necessarily of those, uh, of those commitments until they're posted on the website or until uh, the Arizona Department of Health Services notifies us, which is what's been done so far. So uh, in the meantime, I think um, Supervisor Bishop has provided those numbers for you. And in terms of our cases, and, and Brian's made a good point that um, those are the deaths and, and so forth, uh, and numbers are coming from a specific population, and therefore the rest of the numbers have, you know, been fairly steady, if you will, and not really spiking to the degree that we might see um, if we were seeing a real significant increase in cases. All right, thank you. All right, we're going to take questions from our press. I'm not sure uh, who is on the line yet, but I'll start out with our, our three newspapers. And uh, first of all, turning to uh, the Lake Havasu City Herald, someone aboard there that would like to start off with the uh, question, please. Yeah, this is Daisy Nelson from today's News Herald. Um, I wanted to ask about um, enforcement of those crowds of visitors. Are there any plans for that, or um, is there already enforcement in place? I don't know that I heard the question well. We didn't quite hear you. I don't know if we can run the volume up a little bit louder or not, yeah, uh, Daisy. I, I, I heard you, something about enforcement, but I didn't know if that could was you, about the- Would you mind repeating your question me. one more time, please? Yeah, no problem. Um, I was wondering if there are any plans or um, current enforcement of crowds of visitors that are coming into Mojave County, sorry, Mojave County and Lake Havasu specifically. Roger, I can take that one. Um, yes. Not specifically Lake Havasu, but I can report on uh, the uh, National Lake Mead National Recreation Area. I have been in communications with the superintendent up there and uh, have asked for extra uh, patrol units, uh, rangers, to come into the area of Willow Beach, Temple Bar, and South Cove and that has been accomplished. Uh, I've heard from residents up there that they have seen rangers uh, patrolling the area and uh, as, as far as I know that's uh, that's all that's been uh, happening on the Arizona side although the Nevada side is closed and that's what's bringing the influx of, of boaters and recreators into Arizona because they they can no longer use their own launch pads and their their uh, parks over there all right uh, does Harold have another follow-up um, no I think we're good for that question all right. Uh, do we have someone on board from the uh, Mojave, uh, excuse me, the Mojave Daily News? Yes. Bill McMillan. Yes, Bill, go ahead. Okay. Uh, this is a question primarily for Denise. Have we made any progress on tracking the sources of outbreak, of uh, positive cases that hadn't been linked to previous cases or to travel? At this point, I mean, we we do contact tracing and follow up and investigate with every single case to understand, a, get a better idea of where those cases um, might originate. Um, and sometimes we can link it to another previously existing case and other times, um, there's an unknown source, basically. And, and when we don't indicate that there is an epi link or a linked to a confirmed case, as we're trying to use some different wording since not everybody understands the epidemiology piece, um, but we are uh, identifying where we can and then where it's an unknown source, that's basically the best we can do as far as explaining where that, that originated from. All right. From the uh, Daily Miner, Aga has uh, submitted uh, some questions for me. I, I'm going to go ahead in this case, and uh, there are four of them. One of them requires us a quick answer. How many COVID-19 cases in the county originated in long-term care facilities, and can anyone here identify any of those facilities? 
right now I have a total of 45 cases that have come from long-term care facilities within Mojave County. We are unable to provide an address or location simply because those are our cases and we don't give out addresses for cases. This is where people live oftentimes and we're unable to give out a physical address for a normal case, hence the reason we are not going to give out a case for any of these cases. This is their home. So um, in that case, we are unable to give the locations of those individuals. All right, any, any of the CEOs want to comment on that? Well, as, oh. as I shared earlier, uh, we have had uh, quite a few, about three quarters of the cases that have come in to our facility have been linked uh, to a nursing home. So um, we've had 24 cases, 18 uh, inpatient cases were, were tied to a, to a nursing home. So we don't want to name that facility or facilities then? Just want to follow up on her question here. All right, how many people in uh, the county are working on contact tracing? I believe, now I, I, don't quote me on the number, I'm, I'm trying to think about all the staff that are involved in this process, um, but I would say we have approximately 10 people working on that currently. And uh, can you describe what happens in that contact tracing? Uh, are the contacts told to self-isolate, for example? Well, what they do is they follow up, they're investigating the case originally, and then they reach out to those individuals that may have had close contact with that positive case. And so they reach out to them to find out um, where they've been and try to give them some direction about self-isolating if they feel like they've been around them for more than 10 minutes in close proximity. So that's the big piece. It's not in the same store, it's not in the same business necessarily, but it's in a, a very close space. Um, hence the reason for the six foot physical, physical distancing piece. Um, but over a sustained amount of time to 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. So it's not just uh, I've walked by somebody necessarily. Um, so we continue to follow up with those cases, provide that guidance, and then if there's any questions or concerns, and those individuals have a contact with us, a name and a phone number, that they can contact us back. And they're also monitoring for symptoms. They're given guidance to monitor for symptoms in case they were exposed, and that they can then take the proper steps. And finally, um, the Kingman Miner would like to know what towns, or cities are in the Kingman service area? Oh, shoot, we just put that up on our website also. I, I believe we finished that. Can we, they go we, there? Is that yes. a better way of doing it? Yes, and if, if not, please reach out to me and I will make sure I spell that out for everybody. We, we had a lot of questions about that. We understand the concern mm -hmm. um, and the lack of clarity, so we did identify the communities that fell within each of those service areas. All right, are there a lot? Or just... In some cases, yes. Yeah, but there's a lot of small communities also. Okay, all right. Roger. Yes. Just to clarify, <clears throat> when patients come to the hospital, typically to the ED, uh, but for other reasons as well, and they are exhibiting uh, signs and symptoms that they may have the virus and they meet the criteria, the screening criteria for testing, we will test and if they're well enough to go home, they're given very explicit instructions about self-isolating, quarantining for 14 days, maintaining distance, hygiene, all that stuff. So it's, it's reinforced on the front end, and then if they test positive and the county gets involved, the public health department gets involved, um, they reinforce it there again too. So it's not at the, at the end of the process, it's at the very beginning. All right, thank People you very were told much for that. In very explicit terms, what they need to do to keep their family members safe, their, their friends and neighbors safe, and to not infect anybody else. Thank you. All right, we have, uh, is Paul Lavoie on the line from Radio Central? Yes, Roger, uh, Paul Lavoie, Radio Central News. I have a question for Denise. Um, there's an upcoming blitz of coronavirus testing coming up over the next three weekends uh, where the goal is to test 
around 60,000 Arizonans. There's four counties that are that are chosen: Coconino, Maricopa, Pima, and Yavapai. How is that process uh, done by ADHS, and why is why isn't Mojave County on that list? Well, you know, I, I'm not familiar with how ADHS identified those particular counties to participate. However, I will say that, and it could be because of their cases, the number of cases that they're experiencing. <clears throat> Um, but they would be better to, to answer that particular question. But we do actually have a testing site in Mojave County uh, this Saturday that is part of that blitz. And the Arizona Department of Health Services notified us of this yesterday. And I, as of this morning, I didn't see that site listed on their website, but they made it clear that there would be a testing event at Kingman High School. Uh, from 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. this Saturday. I do know that that's a list, a web page that's continually being updated as organizations, businesses, testing sites, uh, organizations commit to additional Saturday work. And uh, one of the conditions, though, of course, of, of that is that they must have uh, adequate supplies. So they have to provide their own test kits and they have to provide their own PPE for those particular events. And um, I'm not sure if Sonora Quest has um, made any future commitments to any other communities, but I know there's, um, there's some, some work being done to try to spread out uh, into other areas of the county and also throughout the state. Mm -hmm. uh, very quickly, Denise, can you tell me if that's for people who are symptomatic or for antibodies? <laughs> It's, it's for COVID-19 testing, so it's not antibody testing. And it is for people who feel that they've been exposed. And quite honestly, that is the criteria that's been used because the lab that's performing the test, Norquest, does not have to follow the Arizona State Public Health Lab matrix. And so they're able to and will be testing anybody who wishes to be tested. Okay, I have a question later, but uh, it's right. not related to this one. Thank you. All Mark. right, thank you. Um, all right, we'd like to, um, we have others I know on the line too from the press. Uh, please, if you have a question, just identify yourself and your outlet and we'll and ask your question. Go ahead. Dave Hawkins, Rob Hazel, KTOX. Go ahead. K2X, K2X, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Earlier this uh, this week and last week, it was reported that uh, people in Bullhead City are being turned away for testing, even though they are showing symptoms of COVID-19. And in in discussions with uh, the hospital in Bullhead City, the reason that they were turned away is because they are only testing high priority cases. Is this due to a lack of testing uh, kits available? Question. You, yes, uh, Michael Singer. There, there's no question that if somebody meets the screening guidelines that the CDS, CDC has put forth weeks ago, if they meet that criteria, those people will get tested absolutely positively. And we have, okay. plenty, we have, we have plenty of kits in reserve. We, we didn't initially, but we do now. And that was, when I say initially, I'm talking about the first week in March, but today we have plenty. That should not be an issue. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up? Yes, I do. Um, the, the, this, is, this is concerning me because this is, you're telling me something different than uh, your own media people at the hospital have told me. Um, they said that they do not have a sufficient number of, therefore they're only testing high priority cases. Well, we are receiving a shipment of 600 saline kits tomorrow morning, and <laughs> we've only tested 132 so far over the last several weeks, so we'll have plenty in reserve as of tomorrow morning. And right now, we have adequate numbers. Thank you, sir. All Thank right, uh, someone else have a question? Please uh, go ahead. Roger, Dave Hawkins, multiple, multiple media outlets. Um, I want to circle back to some of those figures that Mr. Turney uh, was providing, um, and I want to clarify that if he was talking about a single nursing home, um, while its identity is confidential in, in this instance, um, it's kind
kind of well known throughout the Kingman community, which nursing home we're talking about. Um, so, uh, can Denise or Mr. Turney indicate how many of those infected cases from that nursing home trace to employees versus patients? Yeah, Dave, uh, make sure I understand the question. As far as the, the inpatients, um, yeah, the numbers I shared with you were patients from the nurse, actual patients from the nursing home. And so, um, as I shared with you earlier, uh, currently we have 12 patients in our hospital. Nine of those are from a particular nursing home. Overall, we've had 24 patients admitted uh, being treated for COVID, uh, 18 were from uh, that particular nursing. So, so it's running roughly three quarters uh, of those patients are coming from the nursing home. Um, as, we, as we document each COVID infection person by person, um, would we not know how many people tested positive that were employees of that nursing home rather than patients? Yes, we, we would know also that there's, um, I mean, from the positives, which is a different number, Dave, uh, that, that there could be positives from, from the employees themselves. And I think if anybody's thinking through this, um, the, uh, from a nursing home standpoint, there, there's really only one source of infection, typically. I mean, when you look at the pattern, it's helped. Uh, happened other places, and I can't say for certain what's happening in this particular nursing home, but typically somebody may come in either sick or asymptomatic and be infectious and not know it. And then um, I guess I'd use analogy, if, if you have a spark and that causes a fire, then that can spread within the, the, the particular uh, nursing home. So, I mean, we've seen this happen in many places around the country, and unfortunately it looks like what ha has happened here. So um, the answer to your question is yes, there would, there would certainly uh, be positive employees as well, but not necessarily that they've, been, not, not that they've been admitted to the hospital, if I understand your qu question correctly. I was, yeah, I was trying to find out if any of the employees had been admitted as, either, or if the county would say, well, they're not admitted, but they're, they're positive cases. The, the, the deal is the way the cases have been presented to us, well, we got a couple, they're 65, one's Havasu, one's Kingman. I think it would be highly helpful to know, hey, from one nursing facility, we've got eight employees and 12 patients who tested positive, and we've seen that um, news coverage in New York City where I think 55 people all died from the same facility. That facility's been named. Wouldn't there be a, a public benefit if we're above 20 to disclose to the public the identity of that facility um, so that people would kind of know that that's a place to avoid. Yeah, and I think from our perspective, I mean, we've tried to, to, to work with the county, and I don't know how you feel, Denise. I don't, I, I think most people probably yeah, that, know. So. Mr. 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 Turney, that's, that's a question for Denise, yes. Do, do you want me to answer that? I mean, I'm happy to answer it. It's, it's Desert Highlands is the, the institution that, that, that we're having a problem, unfortunately. Um, and I think every, I think it's been enough in Facebook and other pl places, so um, that's, where the, that's where the struggle is right now. Thank you. Thank you. I have another question. Um, this is AZ Nelson from today's News Herald. I'm wondering if you're able to tell us um, how many of the 45 cases are in each city within the county in nursing homes? So I can tell you that we have, I, I may not be exact in my numbers, okay? So we have 38 in Kingman and we have seven in other communities. And I'm sorry, I can't break up the other two. I don't have the exact numbers and don't want to give you incorrect information. Okay, no worries. And we also have another question from reporter Michael Zog in just a second. Um, could uh, the hospitals uh, kind of 
uh, give me your thoughts on, uh, I guess, the, uh, the governor's orders uh, allowing elective procedures to, uh, to resume and uh, what, what the plans are at your facilities. Um, speaking on uh, behalf of the, uh, what we like to call the Northern Arizona market, which would be Valley View Medical Center. Bob Hanson, KTOX. And Havasu Regional conference. Medical Center. Um, we are in the process now of working with the um, State Department of Health as well as with our um, Hospital Support Center, which is our corporate office, in preparing to meet all the guidelines to open up our facilities in a safe manner. Um, we have been working diligently with both of our medical staffs and our chiefs of staffs and chiefs of surgery to prepare. Um, all the plans that are essential for those patients to be ready for um, any type of procedures that are allowed under the uh, new standards that have been released um, by the governor. Uh, one of the things that we want to keep in mind as well is that there's a lot of pre-testing that will be involved and that pre-testing is also going to involve those patients having a COVID test. So we are preparing um, to be ready for those patients to be screened appropriately. Um, they will be prepared and ready to go for certain surgery in accordance to um, the procedural aspects that we've laid out. But again, both facilities are moving towards opening up um, in uh, May 5th through the 11th timeframe and uh, start bringing in our first cases so that we can start providing care to our community and those patients that uh, meet those qualifications. Thank you. We have another question. Um, Daisy Nelson again from today's News Herald. Um, I'm wondering how many coronavirus deaths have occurred in long-term care facilities or assisted living facilities in the county? This is of our 10, right? Right, right. You know, I don't have that exact number in front of me, um, but I can, I can see if I can generate that for you, okay? Okay, thank you. Another question? Go ahead. Um, when we, the question came up about elective surgeries. Um, we know each of the hospitals is going to uh, be taking a look at when they're going to exercise that option if, if they choose to do so. Um, but can we get from the River City Hospital executives a couple of figures so that we can um, correlate those with what Mr. Turney has provided. Mr. Turney has indicated that KRNC uh, estimates a 30% revenue decline, about $8 million a month, while the elective surgeries have been suspended. Can the other CEOs provide those statistics so we get an overall picture? In terms of surgical procedures, we're down 60% from what we would typically be pre-pandemic, um, and just to tag along with what Feliciano just said, when, when we learned last week that the governor's office was going to lift the ban on elective non-essential surgeries, that didn't mean that every single type of elective surgery is gonna be performed. There are many that will still be prohibited. For those that are deemed essential, meaning if it's not done soon, it could prevent harm later for the patient. For those patients that meet those criteria, and obviously the, the surgeon, um, the attending surgeon will have to make that decision in his or her best medical judgment and attest to that actually in writing. Every patient that will undergo an elective procedure under this new executive order will be required to have a COVID-19 test with results back, not pending, but back and, con and confirmed negative before they can have uh, that procedure done. So this rollout isn't gonna happen immediately. Tomorrow is the effective date, but we all have to get waivers approved from the state before they will allow us to move forward. And there's a lot of things you gotta do to be ready for this. Um, so we're, we're, I mean, we're taking a slow, a slow approach to opening up, uh, but this is not a complete lifting of the ban. This is just relaxing of the rules a little bit, and um, we expect to be back to business in a couple weeks. 
but these would be the only these would be the only patients that would be tested that don't have symptoms. This is just to guarantee the surgeon, the uh, OR staff, the anesthesia staff, and um, everybody else that they're not in an operating room, obviously hovering up above the patient's head uh, during an operation if they are a carrier for the COVID virus. All right. Yes, sir. I was aware of the I was aware of the exemptions and the application procedures to to get back into the surgery business. I was just wondering what the economic impacts uh, during the downtime has been to the River City hospitals. It's been huge. For uh, uh, again, I can only uh, speak to uh, Valley View Medical Center, but um, to mirror off of what um, uh, Mike uh, had mentioned earlier, we're seeing about a 60% decline in our surgical volumes, um, and again, that is a huge financial impact uh, to the facilities. Um, again, uh, we want to make sure that we are. Uh, providing the appropriate care as we get ready to open up our facilities. Um, but the biggest challenge has been the, the fact that patients are um, not coming or have not been coming to our facilities, obviously for their care, um, for those elective procedures. And so that has been um, having a meaningful impact to those organizations. And if you look across the U.S. now, most facilities are seeing a 40 to 60 percent decline. That's the average. Um, and other small rural facilities are also being impacted even more so because it's not just the surgical volume that's impacting them. There's also the secondary volumes that are the physical therapy that goes with orthopedic surgery and also the laboratory um, visits that go with the surgical surgery, uh, surgical cases that have to be worked up to be prepared for uh, those uh, patients to come in. So um, it, it is a, a, a difficult time for a lot of facilities and a big challenge for us has been to make sure that we are working diligently to um, take care of our patients, take care of those revenues that are coming in and in turn that allows us to take care of our staffs. Thank you very much. We, we have a, a texted question here. Uh, we're talking about um, uh, opening things up. Um, this is for Denise. Uh, uh, assuming we haven't reached a peak yet, when do you see reaching the peak? Well, I mean, I, I think we're monitoring the situation. spikes here and there. The initial spike that you saw sometime in mid to late March was really the result of a backlog of testing that had come through. Thanks. Let me step back. I'm sorry. Um, can you repeat the question now? See, that was Just, a short. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, uh, let's, when do you see the peak? Sure. Sure. So we've been monitoring, monitoring the situation, um, and you can see on our website the number of cases per day. You saw a short, or not a short spike, but a spike uh, around March 23rd, and that was due to the backlog of cases that had, and lab results that had, we had been waiting for for some time. Some of those have been, you know, seven to ten days out uh, before we got results from them. Um, but now we are getting those on a more timely basis. So I do think we are seeing a leveling out of our cases. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that that will continue. And I think if we continue to, to operate as we have been with some social distancing, physical distancing, and using all of the preventative steps that we have available to us, that we can, um, we can work our way out of this. All right, thank you. Um, I know, uh, Paul Lavoie, you had another question, right? Yes, uh, this is for Denise. Once patients are determined that they can self-isolate at home, what kind of care or advice do you give those patients um, for the 14-day the or longer period that they're going to be at home as far as uh, treatment options? So, thank you. They are, if they're a positive case, they have a thermometer. They're asked to take their temperature every day, actually twice a day. Um, they're monitoring for their symptoms, so that might be fatigue, it might be the cough, it's certainly the fever. There's now uh, several different, um, several new conditions that have been added or symptoms that have been added to that, and I might need a little bit of help, but loss of taste and smell, uh, fatigue, and 
even a little bit of GI. Problem. Okay. Yes. Thank you. GI issues. So we we are asking them to monitor that because um, <clears throat> their release time is really based on their release as far as their quarantine or isolation is really based on those symptoms. And they have to be symptom free, uh, certainly fever free for 72 hours. Oh my goodness, okay, get my facts straight. Can you? It, yeah, typically it's seven day and th three, three days of fever free and at least seven days total. Yes, so. thank you. Oh. So. Uh, okay, Roger, I have a follow up. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, please. If a person is sent home, and the, is there a way to monitor that they're staying at home? And if they don't, what are the county's options? Is there an enforcement uh, option here? There is, yes. Um, we actually can, we, me, I can issue an order of isolation or an order of quarantine based on the circumstances. And so that, that order is good for 10 days. If we need it to extend beyond 10 days, then we would need to go uh, before a judge and present a case. Is that something where somebody actually stands outside the house or, or monitors that that person is staying inside? It, it, it's somebody who we, in our experience, is non-compliant, has basically stated that they will not follow the isolation or quarantine guidelines. And so therefore we, we basically impose that upon them when necessary, but we try to limit that. We, we prefer voluntary compliance because uh, that's a much better position to be in, but for those that decide and determine that they don't want to abide by that, then we have other options. All right, we need okay, to. Okay, I understand, I'm sorry, Roger. I understand from one of our supervisors that there have been three such cases. Can you verify that? I can, yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, we, we kind of need to wrap things up unless someone has a pressing question that they really want to have answered. All this right. is Daisy Nelson with today's News Herald. Um, I'm wondering, has the county health department needed to hire any more staff to help with the workload during this pandemic? We have just started that process, as a matter of fact. We have brought on an epidemiologist who can assist us with case investigations, data management and uh, contact tracing, and also assist with training staff in contact tracing. And then we have another person who we are considering hiring on a temporary basis to assist us with, again, investigations and contact tracing, because that takes up a fair amount of, of time. All right, folks. Thank you. Anything else? All right, I, um, I want to thank all of you uh, for being here with us today and participating in this. Third time for the gentleman from the hospital. And uh, did you want to add anything else at the conclusion here, Denise? I think we're good. Chairman Bishop, anything additional? Yes, Roger, I'd just like to say that navigating this changing landscape of COVID-19 has been very challenging and frustrating for uh, not only the Board of Supervisors and the Health Department, our hospitals and our communities. It's just uh, something we never thought we would see in, in America and we're learning as we go along. So uh, once again, my sympathies go out to uh, the families of those who have passed and, uh, and uh, like the governor has said over and over again, we're in this together and uh, I'm sure that uh, we'll figure it out. All right, thank you. I want to make sure any of our uh, CEOs have anything else you wanted to add here at the conclusion? I do not. Thank you very much, all of you, for being here. Thanks to the media for tuning in and the public as well. Uh, this will remain on our YouTube site, and you can watch it later if you like. Thank you very much.